The Irish delegation returned to Dublin for a cabinet meeting on December 3rd. Their return was not without event, as early that morning their steamer, Cambria, collided with the schooner James Tyrrell just off Hollyhead. The collision happened at about 4am and Collins was reportedly seen on deck assisting in calming other passengers as two of Cambria's lifeboats were launched to search for the crew of the sunken James Tyrrell. Four of the crew were rescued and it was reported that Collins offered them the cabin of the Irish delegates. Although his offer was refused as the unfortunate men found bedding elsewhere, the night was certainly an eventful one for Collins, Childers and Duffy. None of them could have been well rested when they arrived at what was arguably the most important cabinet meeting of their lives later that same day. The Irish delegates had already agreed with Lloyd George's deadline of December 6th. Thus, this cabinet meeting was to finalise the Irish position. The meeting has generated much historical debate, and volumes have been written in search of a valid interpretation of its events. It is generally agreed that it was disorderly, confused, and that personal hostility occasionally broke out between some cabinet members. It resulted in the delegation returning to London with instructions not to sign a treaty containing an oath of allegiance to the King as head of the Irish state, but also with vague instructions as to what a suitably amended oath might look like. They would also retain their signatory powers. Collins arrived back in London on Sunday, December 4th. During the course of the day, he received a letter that Kiernan had penned on December 1st. It was a rather long production and again expressed love while outlining some doubts as to their future. My very dear Michael, when I awoke this morning, the first thing I thought was of the letter I wrote last night. It was still lying on the table. It was a silly letter, I know, but I decided to post it, 11 o'clock post, as I had never been sorry for anything I wrote to you, no matter how silly and stupid it appeared afterwards. I was doubly glad today when your long letter came that I had sent it. I liked your letter very much and it made me full of resolutions. I really probably misunderstood you. You asked me if I recall the letter you wrote me one night very late in Dublin. You might not ask. I recall only too well all our little episodes before you went to London. The connection with Dublin and you, I look back on with the greatest happiness and I delight to think about it. I have seemed to have had no worries then, no thought of anything, but just live for the day. Perhaps it was that I had not the same feelings for you that I have now. I hope you are not hinting at me in your letter when you remark that you don't like demonstrative people. I quite agree and hate it in public. And sometimes you must get fed up with me telling you about the change I feel so keenly that has come over me. When I cease to be surprised shortly, it should be more comfortable for you. But you will forgive me just once more for boring you about it. Then I was easily pleased and quite happy. I felt you liked me, that you were sure about it, and I didn't worry and was very sensible too. But I found that I grew to love you more and more each day, and then the worries began. I thought if you discovered this, you might cool off, and I tried to be a bit elusive, and then became too serious, far too serious to my mind to hide it, and I let you know in every way. But all the same, I wasn't brave enough. I was afraid. Every day the feelings grew stronger and with it the fear because I had always had a feeling that I never thought anybody wants it. I'd be very, very keen, not realising at first that you might be the one, poor you. It came on gradually. Ah, you did it. You knew the way, like the song. Anyhow, I then realised how serious it was for both of us. And of course, I got all the more anxious and made you happy. But I had also the feeling that I wanted you to be free absolutely to change if you wished. And that's why, and I'm sure you may have misunderstood me often, I gave you so many chances just because I liked you. Otherwise, I wouldn't have worried. And I assure you, it would have been all the same to me. As all men were alike, more or less, I believed. And I could have made it easy by not saying anything, almost taking it all for granted, as so many do, only you were so sincere and straight. I wanted to be the same and give you every chance. In the beginning in Dublin, those ideas never entered my head seriously, although I used to talk. It was later when I realised I fought it successfully for a short time, and then I decided, if it were a question of marriage, two nights before Helen's wedding on the stairs and the night following it, when you really wanted me, why not marry the one I really love? And what a cowardly thing of me to be afraid to marry the one I really want and who loves me just as well as any of the others I thought of marrying. 
Then London came. I should not have gone. It gave rise to such talk. People got to know about it. I thought about it better from a girl's very conventional and narrow point of view, that we better have something definite, and so we have drifted. Please, sweetheart, don't misunderstand me now. I can't explain. It is only I felt if we were ever to part, it wouldn't be easier for both of us, especially for me, to do it soon, because later it would be bitter for me. But I'd love you just the same, even if we both or you decided on it. Now, don't think by this that I want to row or want you to end it. Not likely. I want you only not to think bad of me when we had those scenes testing you with the feeling of a girl better have it now than later. If you were me, you would see it clearly too. Don't think I want you to decide definitely now. I am happy to drift and drift as long as I know you love me and we will be one day together. I fancy sometimes as girls do a little nest, you and I, two comfy chairs, a fire and two books. Now I'm not too ambitious and no worries. You're feeling perfectly free as if not married and I likewise. I do believe, as you used to say, it will be a great arrangement. I will promise you when we feel perfectly confident, as I have done for ages, I have no more wows. Truly, if I didn't love you so well, I wouldn't want your love so badly. I always picture, do you like my picture? Myself sitting on your knee, not the two big chairs so often, until I tire you. Cruel, isn't it? We will, won't we, be real lovers? Say we will. You don't trust me or answer my important questions. And as the one I have a dim recollection of if you liked me to love you so much or if it was a nonsense. Can't you tell me all your worries? If you can't have me as a friend, who is ready to do anything for you almost? Who could you trust? This must finish now and it's some letter. You couldn't bring yourself to write this sort of thing. The famous MC. All I wish now is that it pleases you, gives you some sunshine and helps you make the day easy for you. That will always be my ambition. With that, we should have no worry. Believe me, your own little pet, friend and everything kit. I've heaps more to write, but the post goes now. Excuse writing in haste, Kay. On that same day, a furious row broke out among the members of the Irish delegation. Childers, Barton and Duffy redrafted the final Irish proposal to omit all references to Dominion status. They argued that de Valera had instructed them to do so on the basis that it was consistent with his proposed amendments to the oath. If such an instruction had occurred, it had happened on the margins of the Cabinet meeting and was not at all clear. Collins was furious. He felt that this amended document merely undid all of the progress he and Griffith had made, and he refused to go to the meeting where it was presented to the British. That meeting broke down in impasse when the British refused to contemplate the Irish proposal, and the Irish delegation prepared to return home. But later that night, the Cabinet Secretary, Tom Jones, was dispatched to see if any bridges might be built with Griffith. He found a troubled Griffith, who managed to assure him that all might not be lost if some vague commitment on unity might be obtained from Craig, but carrying any settlement would require the consent of Collins, whom it was thought could persuade the more extreme Irish Republicans. Griffith and Jones agreed that Collins should meet Lloyd George on December 5th. That morning, Collins and Lloyd George discussed the possibility of a settlement and concluded that such a possibility still existed. The delegations met again that evening and the Irish did their best to steer the conversation towards Ulster. How could they agree to an oath unless Craig agreed to the possibility of an all-island settlement? Lloyd George produced the memo that Griffith had signed assuring the Prime Minister that he would not repudiate a boundary commission. The die was cast. Griffith would agree to an oath in exchange for a boundary commission in accordance with his previous assurances. Some minor concessions were then offered by the British in dropping their free trade demands, accepting the right of the Irish to protect their coast with revenue and fishery protection vessels, and accepting, with minor verbal changes, an oath redrafted by Collins. The Irish delegates then returned to their headquarters with a warning from Lloyd George. They could return and sign the treaty, or the Prime Minister would inform Craig that they had refused to do so. This would mean war within three days. 
After a furious row between the members of the Irish delegation, all five returned to Downing Street and signed the treaty in the early hours of December 6th. That momentous day is bookmarked by two halves of a letter Collins wrote to Kiernan. The first was written before his morning meeting with Lloyd George set the search for a settlement back in motion on December 5th. The second came after he had signed the treaty in the early hours of December 6th. Before he signed, he assures Kiernan that any doubts of hers as to their future happiness will always be very much in the front of my mind. After he signed, he hopes that he has brought peace to this land of ours. Dearest Kit, your letter of the 1st of December was given to me yesterday afternoon, soon after I'd written my letter to you. I liked it, and believe me, I liked it not a bit less for the thoughtfulness. If the question were of no interest at all to me, surely I could not blame you for having concern for your own future and your lifelong happiness. When it does so very closely concern myself, I cannot blame you more. This is really my straightforward, genuine point of view, and remember that if you ever express doubts, I always have that in the back of my mind, or indeed very much in the front of my mind. And that's that. When you know I think of it in this way, don't you feel it gets rid of any necessity to answer your questions in detail? Tell me this. Ever so many thanks for the brushes. They are very delightful and I do really and truly appreciate them. Michal, not Michael. I must try having this put right. No doubt it can be done. Tuesday, 6th of December, 1921. Thus far I had got yesterday morning when I was called to go to a conference and what a day I had afterwards. Finished up at Downing Street at 2.15 this morning. To bed at about five and up to go to Mass and didn't, need I say it, forget your candle. My plans in regard to home are as yet uncertain. I don't know how things will go down now, but with God's help we've brought peace to this land of ours. A peace which will end this old strife of ours forever. I should have liked very much to write fully to you, but today is worse than yesterday. There are all sorts of interviews, photographers, etc., etc. There are further meetings to be attended also and therefore I must finish. You will not think any worse of me by not receiving a letter this morning. You will see I wrote part of it, so that the spirit was there all right. Every blessing to you, and fondest love, M. Collins died a little more than eight months later.